Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mechanical Ventilation 101. My name is Kwebinaw Seiponsu, and I'm a clinical specialist in the respiratory therapy department at the St. Boniface Hospital. This lecture is divided into four sections. Each section will be followed by a recap quiz. Prior to going ahead with this lecture, I would like for you to have watched two videos. One is from osmosis.org and is the video titled Respiratory Anatomy and Physiology. The second video is from Smith Medical, and that's a Smith Medical YouTube channel, um, and it's a video titled The Suction Pro 72 Closed Suction System. You only need to watch about the 10, first 10 minutes of the video to understand what the video is talking about and how the system works. So without further ado, let's start off with the lecture. So what is a ventilator? So a ventilator is a machine that does useful work, respiratory work. It's a flow generating, pressure regulated, microprocessor controlled electrical, usually, machine. Many types of ventilators exist. Um, in this lecture, we will separate or we'll differentiate between two types of ventilators. Now, there are other separations, but I don't think those are pertinent to this lecture. The first one is the bedside ventilator. This is primarily used in the ICU setting at the bedside. These ventilators are not built for transport because they usually do not have adequate battery life to be able to achieve transportation. On the left is the Puritan Bennett 980 ventilator, and on the right is the Hamilton G5 ventilator. Below that are the transport ventilators. If you work at St. Boniface Hospital or Health Science Center, you most likely would have come across these two. These ventilators work absolutely the same way, except the one on the left is built for intra-facility transportation, so going from eMERGE to um, CT to ICU, whatever the case is, or for short-term ventilation. The one on the right is a little bit more robust and is built for inter-facility transport. So if you've seen the inter-facility transport team, you'll see that they exclusively use T1 ventilators or something built similar to that. So just a quick recap quiz. Ventilators are always electrically powered. Is that true or false? That is false. The inner workings between a C1 and a T1 ventilator are the same. That is true. The Hamilton G5 ventilator can be used as a transport ventilator. That is false. Why do we ventilate? Now, why? while I cannot tell you the, the statistics, I think um, the predominant reason we ventilate can be categorized into three different situations. Inability to maintain your airway, increase carbon dioxide retention, or decrease oxygenation. If any or if any of the above situations are anticipated. Now before we go into ventilation itself, I think it's important to understand how the respiratory system works. So we first, so then it makes it easier to understand the principles of ventilation. This is where I would, have, I would like you to have watched the video I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, which talks about respiratory anatomy and physiology. So the anatomy of the respiratory system starts from the upper airway, which is divided into the nasal pharynx, the oral pharynx, and the laryngopharynx. Moving on from there, the anatomy of the lungs is divided into the chest wall and the actual lung tissue. The chest wall consists of the sternum, the ribs and cartilage, and the spine. That is what will make your chest wall. And then the lung tissue itself, or the lungs, are divided into a left and right side. The right side has three lobes, the upper, middle, and lower lobe, and the left side has two lobes, the upper and lower lobe. Gas exchange happens at the level of the alveoli, which, um, again, this, this is where oxygen is transferred from the lungs into the blood. So before going on, two parts of that video that I would like to recap are mechanics and gas exchange. So we'll speed through this because the video itself will not play. So basic mechanics. In lung mechanics, as the video mentioned, inspiration is achieved when the diaphragm contracts and moves down, and the chest wall moves up. 
This creates negative pressure and allows a volume of air to fill our lungs. Expiration occurs when the reverse happens, so the chest wall collapses towards the patient, and of course the diaphragm moves up, this creates positive pressure and pushes air out. Now why is this important and why should you know this? The reason you should know this is is the reason you should know this is because of compliance. Compliance is defined as the ease with which these actions happen. And there are many factors that go into this, of course. But there are a few things that are pertinent to emergency department, to the emergency department. So example, the weight on the chest will decrease the ability for the chest wall to move up and out to create that negative pressure. And it's important to know that. So for example, a patient with a BMI of 45 centimeters per kilogram will have significantly less compliance compared to a patient with a BMI of 20 centimeters per kilogram. That means that for a given change in pressure, they will have less volume. Therefore, if a patient like this is put on a ventilator who has lower compliance, you will run into situations where you have alarms, high pressure alarms, um, or low tidal volume alarms, and what have you. Uh, it's important to understand the context of, this, of these alarms. That is why I mentioned that. The other part of the video I would like to talk about is gas exchange. Now, the video talked about the pathway of gas exchange. Um, gas exchange, ha or the pathway of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and gas exchange happens at the alveoli level. Now, at the alveoli level, oxygen moves from the alveoli into the blood, and carbon dioxide moves in the reverse direction. When there is no blood flow, we say that we are dead space ventilated. And when there is blood flow and there is no ventilation, as in there is no air in the alveoli, either because of collapse or due to pneumonia, we say the person is shunted. So it's important to know these terms, and we'll further the elaborate on these terms later on in this lecture. So why do you need to know all of this in the first place? Let's look at some stats. So there was a study from 2012, which looked at four emergency departments in Toronto, looking at length of stay of patients requiring mechanical ventilation in the emergency department. Patients receiving mechanical ventilation exclusively had a median length of stay of 4.6 hours. The study also found that emergency department to ICU times, less than two hours, have been associated with shorter days on a ventilator and in the ICU. And of course, our goal in patient care is always to reduce the length of stay in the hospital. So on machines like the ventilator in the ICU, um, hopefully on the wards and bring, taking patients back to their home to be with their families. At St. Boniface Hospital, we saw an average of 20 ventilated patients monthly in our ED from May 2019 to August 2020. Now, if my math is correct, that leads to 92 hours of exposure to ventilators monthly. That's 92 hours of exposure to ventilators not knowing how to be safe around a ventilator. This can lead to unfavorable situations, as well as tie up hospital resources. And with an aging population, with most likely more are seeing more pandemics, that demand is going to go up. So what is the solution to this? The solution is vent safe. So it's a term I coined myself. Essentially, it's a term that refers to moving basic ventilator care in the emergency department towards an approach akin to that in the ICU, where it's interdisciplinary, where a nurse by the bedside understands what the ventilator is doing and understands basic troubleshooting around the ventilator. So VentSafe talks about ventilator and ventilation basics alarms and troubleshooting, and interventions, finally, when something bad happens, what are you to do? This means that nurses will have to know, at the very least, the basics of the ventilator and ventilation. Okay, so that's the purpose of this course. 
Now, keep, please keep in mind that respiratory therapy will continue to maintain a minimum Q2H vent checks, a vent check schedule, which is in line with our hospital policy. So, a short recap quiz. Humidification and filtration is achieved in the nasal cavity and sinuses. That is true. Food and air share a common path up until the larynx. That is true. Aspiration is most likely to occur in the left lung. That is false. Bronchial arteries carry deoxygenated blood. That is false. And I know that's a bit of a trick question. Gas exchange happens at the alveoli. That is true. Emergency department to ICU times greater than two hours are associated with worse outcomes. That is true. This concludes part one of this lecture.